Yes, so um, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure today to introduce our keynote speaker, our second keynote spe speaker, Dr. Ash Hood. So Ash is a, uh, a lecturer in Earth Sciences at the University of Melbourne. Uh, she did her, her first degree and her PhD there, followed by a postdoctoral fellowship. And then she spent several years at Yale uh, with various postdoctoral fellowships, including one uh, based on ast uh, in the astrobiology area. Uh, Ash's work is uh, concerns the evolution of seawater chemistry, but she, f she really is a, a, a true interdisciplinary scientist. Her work is very firmly uh, placed within the context of very careful, extensive field work, and uh, in particular, beautiful, meticulous uh, petrography, where she uses the whole arsenal of imaging techniques that are available to us. So we're delighted to have her with us today. Uh, it's uh, a very different time in Melbourne when she should be having a nice cold beer. So thank you, Ash. Um, but she's going to give us um, her, her keynote today, which is on the, the chemical history of, of seawater insights from marine carbonates. So over to you, Ash. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. I'll share my screen. Okay. So um, firstly, I just want to start by saying thanks very much to the organizers for putting this together. It's my first online conference and I'm very excited to be here. And thanks everyone, of course, for tuning in. Um, I'd also like to give special thanks to my puppy who has just eaten our Wi-Fi repeater. So um, hopefully our connection stays good throughout the talk. Um, and then today I've given this talk the title, The Chemical History of Seawater, which was pretty bold. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on and I could be speaking for several years about this. Um, so I've decided to focus the talk on some new work that the community has been doing and some new work that um, my collaborators and I have been doing, looking at the redox history of the Earth, um, of seawater, and also at major element cycling um, on the early Earth. And these are insights, of course, from marine carbonates. So I'd just like to um, point out my co-authors down the bottom here, Shuang, Noah and Malcolm, who done a lot of the work that I'll be presenting towards the end of the talk. I wanted to start the talk with this quote from Tim Lowenstein, um, his review paper on history of seawater, um, because it tells us a little bit about the importance of, of looking at seawater through time. So some looking to the stars wondered if the oceans of Earth's past might guide us for the search for life beyond the world. Others looking to the future wondered if the past might help foretell one's fate. And not only I think is one of this, like this is one of the most beautiful things I've ever read in a scientific paper, I think it really highlights why it is important to look at the history of seawater on Earth. So for things like trying to understand life on other planets when we eventually find it, um, hopefully, and then also looking at things like global warming and how that's going to affect the oceans in the future. So I mentioned I'll be focusing mainly on these two aspects of seawater chemistry through time. So at the top here is a redox history of the last 4 billion years of, of Earth's history. This is a compilation, again, from Tim Lowenstein's review paper, showing that we go from an Earth that was dominated by anoxic, iron-rich and sulfur-rich conditions in the early Earth's history into a period of um, transient redox and then into fully oxidised oceans in the, in the Phanerozoic. So there's really been a trend in this redox work, I think, to look broadly at the whole history of the Earth and particularly at the Precambrian. And so for this talk, I want to push this into the Phanerozoic and discuss some of the nuances that um, have appeared in the Phanerozoic record of redox as well. And then following from that, I'll change, change gears a bit and focus a little bit on this major element cycling. And so in this case, I'm going to look at magnesium calcium ratios, um, project these back from the Cambrian back all the way through the Precambrian using the carbonate record. Um, and I think there's been a lot of recent work by sedimentologists, by geochemists to unravel this history of seawater. And um, really, it'd be nice to integrate a lot more of this work, I think, a lot better. Um, and so hopefully I'll show some of this integrated work in this talk. So this is a, um, a very complicated um, slide showing how we can look at the composition of seawater at any point in time. Um, and so obviously this, it's a complicated system. The, the chemistry of seawater is controlled by so many different aspects here. Um, so we normally put elements into the ocean via continental weathering, by riverine input. And then there's a number of processes that we can, that we can remove elements from seawater. 
And so that includes things like high temperature alteration here on the right. Um, so this is tectonically controlled heat flux related, um, where we exchange the seawater with the ocean crust. Um, low temperature alteration, this is clay formation. This can remove and add elements to seawater as well. Um, and then of course, as, we, as our tectonic regime changes, as we subduct this crust and recycle it and, and weather it again, seawater is ultimately controlled by, by tectonics and by climate um, weathering processes. And there's a secular change in seawater related to these processes. Um, the atmosphere, of course, and, and volcanism and aspects like this are important in a gas exchange with the oceans. And this controls things like redox evolution through time. Um, of course, as well, biology, which I've perhaps unfairly represented with these green blobs, um, has a huge impact on seawater chemistry too. Um, and including things such as the oxygenation of the oceans um, via life. Um, and so nicely, I think carbonates record um, both inorganically and organically, like this giant coccolithophore here, um, they record the history of seawater fairly directly and both both of these archives, I think, have given us a lot of recent and, and ancient insights into seawater chemistry. So I wanted to start, I'll start with a little bit of background here. So um, I wanted to start with the point, though, that I think um, that we should potentially all agree on by now, hopefully, um, which is that seawater chemistry has changed significantly through time, from our Archean, early Earth, all the way through to our modern day, um, there's been quite spectacular changes in seawater chemistry. Um, and along with this, of course, our carbonate, our marine carbonate record has changed significantly through time as well. And so here's an example that's close to my heart. Um, I've been banging on about dolomite for years. And this is a new paper that's come out by Marjorie Canteen and others showing the distribution of dolomite in this lighter colour and, and limestone in this darker blue through the Precambrian and into the Cambrian in yellow here. And what this shows is that the Precambrian is, is really dominated by dolomite. And this was first um, discussed by people like Ronoff in the, in the 60s. Um, and this has been termed the Precambrian dolomite problem because compared to the Cambrian and, and most of the Phanerozoic, actually um, we see a huge abundance of dolomite in the Precambrian. Um, and, and I would argue, and um, I get into strife about this all the time, but I would argue that this is in fact related to this changing seawater chemistry. So I'll come back to this towards the end of the talk. But the style of carbonate precipitation over time um, is in fact, is in related directly to this, this seawater conditions. And so here's a nice um, graph from John Grotzinger's paper where he shows that through from the Archean all the way through to the end of the Proterozoic, we see a big change in seawater chemistry where initially we have anoxic conditions that are um, potentially highly supersaturated seawater that are precipitating cements directly on the seafloor. And this is something characteristic of the Archean. As we go through the Proterozoic, we lose um, some of that inorganic precipitation. And instead, um, we have a world that's more dominated by biological carbonate precipitation towards the end of the Neoproterozoic. Um, and I've added in here this delightful trilobite from the Phanerozoic with its um, amazing calcite eyes that I think highlights um, that by the Phanerozoic, biomineralization and biological carbonate precipitation really has taken over. And so of course, this, this style of carbonates is directly influenced by the type of conditions that we see in seawater. So in the next couple of slides, I now wanna go through uh, basically the entirety of Earth's history. Um, using uh, just really broadly before I start on the redox history. So in the early earth, we see really reducing environments. We uh, think before about 2.4 billion years that the earth was uh, largely very reducing. The oceans were full of dissolved iron, they were green. The skies were basically methane rich and orange. Um, we see the first evidence from marine life, in fact, in the carbonate record. Um, probably the, the first widely agreed upon evidence at around about 3.4 with the first stromatolites. We see the great oxygenation event after this, which um, is, is called great, but potentially added a little bit more oxygen to the atmosphere and oceans. Um, and during this time, again, as I've just mentioned, we see these unusual seafloor fans. So down the bottom left here are examples from the Archean Camberand group. These are aragonite seafloor fans. And we don't really see this precipitation today. 
So down the bottom right, I just wanted to highlight um, one thing that I think is really neat about carbonates to look at chemical history of seawater is that they can tell us not only about um, changes through time, but also about changes with depth. Um, and so here we see in the deep water of this Canberran group, this is around about 2.5 billion, we have really iron rich dolomites, which is suggesting that our seawater is full of iron and therefore largely anoxic. Um, but on the platform, we see an alternation between manganese rich dolomites and limestones and metal poor dolomites and limestones. And this suggests, I think, that our platforms um, are showing evidence of these oxygen oases on the early Earth. Um, and so this kind of detail is really only possible to get from the carbonate record. So going on from the early Earth, we then transition into the mid Proterozoic, which has been un unfavorably called the Boring Billion. Uh, this nice picture from the Maldives here is, is how I imagine this place to be. It must have been very nice. Um, we think recent work has shown that with these oceans were probably um, low productivity, work by Peter Crockford and others. Um, we think there's no evidence really of unstable climates at all because of the steady carbon isotope record through this time, probably potentially warm like the Maldives, um, but unfortunately probably very low oxygen. Um, there's been thoughts that the, the, both the atmosphere and the oceans at this time were relatively anoxic, um, potentially with some oxygenation events. And then up at the right here, I've got some unusual carbonates that come from this period of time. These are molar tooth structures. These are unusual stigmatically folded cracks which fill with a type of microspar that I think we still really don't know um, necessarily how they form. But I think the fact that they're forming during this Proterozoic interval is telling us of something about seawater chemistry that has um, potentially yet to be worked out fully. And so from this quiescent time, we then head into the Neoproterozoic where things go a bit crazy. Um, we have huge climate instability. So the snowball earth theory where the entire earth um, was thought to have potentially frozen over. Um, and this, in fact, this record is almost based entirely on carbonates. Even the glacials are made of carbonates in some cases. Um, we see the juxtaposition of these huge carbonate platforms with glacial deposits. And these are capped by these unusual marine dolomites, um, cap carbonates. Um, and so a lot of our, our knowledge of seawater through this time is actually based on, uh, based on carbonates. And we think that during the glacials, the oceans actually had very unusual seawater chemistry. Um, during this time as well, we see the neoproterozoic oxygenation event. And this starts to introduce um, oxygen into the oceans more permanently for the, for the first time, or slightly more permanently. Um, this is a time where we see the evolution of animals, of course, with the things like the Ediacaran biota. And Fred Boyer and Rachel Wood have done a lot of work on this, and you can see this actually in Rachel's talk on SEDS Online. Um, and then, of course, our favourite weird carbonates from the Neoproterozoic are these giant ooids here, which uh, unfortunately I haven't put a scale. It's not quite the size of the entire Earth, but these are about a centimetre across. And um, recent work by Lizzie Trower and others has suggested that potentially these um, imply that seawater is highly supersaturated and in fact could be related to these unstable climate conditions during this time. Following on from that we go into the Phanerozoic where um, generally uh, I think there's been an impression um, in the field to, to suggest that seawater must be kind of near normal by the time we get into the Phanerozoic with these intervals of anoxia or intervals of mass extinctions or acidification that occur um, at some points during this Phanerozoic history. We have really nice records from marine carbonates of things like oxygen isotopes, about climate ice volume, about um, carbon isotope, carbon cycling, um, weathering processes through strontium isotopes, and all of these are based on our carbonate record. You know, we can look at this Phanerozoic and we can say, wow, there was an angelfish hanging around in the Miocene and we know exactly where it lived and it was on a Tuesday afternoon. This is maybe not quite this much detail, but I think there's a huge amount of research that's been done on the Phanerozoic to paint a really eventful history of seawater through this time. And the detail that we can get out of this record is really incredible. So um, this is a recent paper by Michael Henehan um, showing uh, boron isotope in foraminifera through the KPG boundary. And so boron isotopes are a record of ocean pH. And Michael spent, um, spent ages count, counting thousands and thousands of forams through this event. And he actually showed that on this very short time scale, right when the, um, 
when the asteroid impact occurred that we see a big drop in mixed layer pH. And this suggests that, um, of course, the asteroid was you know, a significant part of, of this mass extinction event, unfortunately for this, this poor plesiosaur over here. Um, but this sort of amazing detail is, um, is possible through the use of marine carbonates. So I'll start now on thinking a little bit about our redox history. Um, so again, here's this graph by Tim Lowenstein showing through time um, the different parts of the ocean and how they changed roughly with redox. Um, so here's our great oxygenation event in the Archean and our Neoproterozoic oxygenation event. And it's often assumed that um, after this point in Earth's history that the oceans become fully oxygenated. Um, and that's often a, a part of these all of time plots is that it's difficult to plot on all this variability. And the question that a lot of work and a lot of carbonate work has kind of put forward more recently is, did the oceans actually become oxygenated much later than we previously thought? And so there are a lot of different proxies that, um, that we can use in carbonates. So traditionally things like carbon isotopes to talk about carbon cycling on Earth. Um, more recently, chromium isotopes in carbonates have been used. And there are some really um, potentially really cool things coming out of that record. Um, I think potentially we need a bit more information on how that system works before, um, before we can say anything uh, a little bit more detailed. But these three um, proxies here, so iodine calcium, which looks at, at disoxic conditions, um, uranium isotopes, which look more at global redox conditions, and the serum anomaly, which again looks at kind of local to basinal scale um, towards the higher end of the oxygen spectrum. These three things tell us um, can tell us some really um, great insights into this, this transitional interval in the, the early Phanerozoic. So I'm going to start with uh, the serum anomaly work that Malcolm and I did in 2017. And so the serum anomaly is basically the relative amount of serum compared to the other rare earth elements. Serum is the only redox sensitive, um, one of the only redox sensitive rare earth elements. And so um, when it's oxidized, it's removed from seawater. So this gray line here at a serum anomaly of one um, means that there's no removal of serum occurring. So we're looking at, at anoxic conditions. When we get above about the manganese redox boundary, we start to remove serum from seawater and we get a progressively negative serum anomaly when we move up, up this graph. And so you can see here that through the Precambrian, through this early, this Tonian and Cryogenian record, that we have relatively anoxic conditions. The red dots are the averages from each data set, I should say. And the, the um, samples themselves are shallow marine carbonates. Um, we see a transient um, oxygenation event in the Ediacaran. And this has been documented a number of different ways as well. Um, potentially we need more data in here and Malcolm is working on this right now, I think. Um, but then we see a drop to more anoxic looking conditions in the Paleozoic. So, this, was, um, this has been something that has been suggested a number of times, but hasn't really, I don't think, taken hold in the literature until recently. And so this data then suggests that our modern-like oceans start with this kind of resilient oxygenation start in the Devonian when we see the rise of land plants, which of course change a lot of carbon cycling on Earth. Um, so I wanna focus now on this Ediacaran transient event using a different proxy. And that's the uranium isotopes and carbonates. So uranium isotopes are thought to be a relatively global redox proxy. Um, and here we're looking at a time around about 570 million years ago when we see this big um, negative carbon isotope excursion. This is the wanaka shuram carbon isotope excursion. And this is around about the same time that we see the Ediacara biota evolve. And here's one for the purposes of this talk preserved in limestone. Um, these, this negative carbon isotope excursion has been much debated as to the cause of it, whether it's deposition or diagenesis, for example. But this new uranium isotope data set from Fei Fei Zhang and Zi Heng Li and others shows um, a transition from negative uranium isotopes, which represent more anoxic conditions, into more positive values through the excursion, which suggests more oxidizing conditions. And then um, actually when we get out of this, a drop again to more anoxic looking seawater. And this again is suggesting um, some really important things about oxygenation during this time. Uh, and both of these proxies agree, which is really a really nice thing. So the third proxy that I wanna talk about, and I hope you're not getting um, proxy fatigue, 
uh, is iodine calcium ratios. And so this is, an, this is a proxy because iodine, the oxidized form of iodine iodate, is the only form of iodine that is incorporated into carbonates. So basically the more iodine we have, the higher we are here, the more oxidized we are. And this is really looking at the upper end of this oxygenation spectrum now. So again, we're looking through, through all of time, or most of time, and from about most of the Proterozoic, we see very, very low um, iodine calcium ratios suggesting um, anoxia like, like most of our other records show. We see potentially a brief blip again with the Ediacaran biota, um, a, a drop again, so the same as the cerium record, um, and then a rise in the Devonian associated with trees, very similar again to these, these um, other carbonate records. Um, but th what this data set shows by Lou and others is that we don't really maintain um, a resilient oxygenated ocean until the Mesozoic, in fact. Um, and they suggest this is actually um, the biosphere that's controlling this. And, and this is much later than I, I'd say a lot of us had really thought, um, you know, the modern ocean would have existed for more than 200 million years. Um, and this, these three data sets together, I think, paint a really nice picture of um, these transient conditions in redox that extend much farther into the Phanozoic than potentially um, we originally thought. And so here's my, um, my interpretation of redox, all of redox through all of time. And this is a bit of an homage to Jackson Pollock. So up the top again is this, is this box model that tells us roughly potentially what's happening in the oceans. But in reality, most of this interval from the Proterozoic into the Phanerozoic is characterized by very unstable, very transient redox conditions, both st um, spatially and temporally. And uh, Chris Reinhardt and others have done a lot of work modeling these conditions. Um, but I think that, you know, it's only now we're suggesting that it's only really the latest of the Phanerozoic that we see our modern type of oceans in terms of redox chemistry. Okay, so I'm gonna switch gears a little bit here um, and talk now about, um, instead of pushing our redox history into the Phanerozoic, pushing our kind of magnesium cycling back into the Precambrian, a different aspect of seawater chemistry. And there has been quite a lot of work done on looking at Precambrian major element cycling. So um, things like calcium isotopes, uh, sulfur isotopes, these big cycles um, have been pushed back by a number of people, um, Sasha Turchin, Clara Blattler and others, Rosalie Tostevin, for examples, for calcium isotopes. Um, but today I'm going to focus on magnesium. So magnesium, of course, is my favourite element because it goes into dolomite, which is the best mineral out there. Um, so magnesium is thought to be tectonically controlled um, in seawater, like many other elements. And so down the bottom here is um, a kind of a mass balance of this magnesium cycle. So we think it's, it's put into um, oceans by rivers, and it's taken out largely by high temperature alteration. And this is the mid-ocean ridge flux, which um, brine flux, which takes magnesium up into the crust and switches it with calcium in the oceans. Magnesium is also taken out in low temperature um, clay formation. And so this is um, an important process and potentially gaining more and more importance as we, um, as we go through the more recent literature. Um, and then, of course, magnesium is removed into carbonates as well. So overall, the strength of this high temperature flux is controlled by um, heat loss and tectonism, um, which of course then, when um, the crust is subducted, it remelts, comes up again, and forms the riverine um, input. So overall, this is thought to change, change with tectonic cycles over time. So in general, in the Phanerozoic, high magnesium oceans tend to be associated with aragonite precipitation. So this is these so-called aragonite seas. Um, they also tend to be associated with cold climate conditions like the Permian. Uh, so low CO2, uh, low rates of marine clay formation. And we think um, by Hardy's model at least that this is controlled by low seafloor spreading rates. So we're just simply not taking up as much magnesium into this brine and mid-ocean ridges. <coughs> And over the Phanerozoic, there's, I think, now a really nice detailed compilation. Um, this is, again, is from Tim Lowenstein's paper of this changing magnesium calcium balance through time. And so today we have relatively high amount of magnesium. And as we go back through time, we, um, we change to low magnesium conditions where we precipitate calcite. 
and higher again where it's potato aragonite. And this is not um, this is not an exact science. This is um, you know, we largely precipitate aragonite and high magnesium calcite, but this is not conducive to every single environment in the oceans. It's just a, a dominant process. Um, but the neat thing about this more detailed record in, that we have is that it's, it's really nicely been put forward back in the 70s and 80s by people like Philip Sandberg. So he's shown, he's looked at ooid mineralogy and he's simply noticed that there's a change in ooids from aragonite to calcite um, through the Phanerozoic. And so this is a relatively simple, simple way to look at this, this changing um, magnesium calcium history. And here doesn't actually have any estimates, of course, from magnesium calcium here. Um, it's not as empirical as our modern um, way of doing this. But the neat thing is, is, is how well this lines up with our modern record of magnesium calcium. And so what I thought to do for the Precambrian was to extend this um, record back through time using this relatively simple approach of just um, some petrography. So I have been compiling over the last several years now, um, all literature I could find and all rocks I could find from the Precambrian that had ooids in them. And so here on the left is an aragonite ooid, which has a tangential cortice, um, and it can be recognized um, by these cortices in thin section, or also often from dissolution textures. Calcite ooids, on the other hand, have this more radial texture um, and they're often better preserved in the record. Um, because the Precambrian record is not as nice as our Phanerozoic record, we don't have as much rocks, basically. Um, I've tried, decided to supplement this ooid record with marine cements. Um, so again, the, these can be recognized petrographically. So aragonite on the left here via its botryoidal form and its poor preservation, acicular um, needles, calcite by its relatively good preservation. This is, has been dolomitized in this example. And then um, the work that I did during my PhD was looking at dolomite as a marine cement which precipitated from seawater, um, which we think is probably related to relatively high magnesium conditions overall because um, it requires magnesium in its crystal structure. And so this, the records that I've produced from the marine cements and the ooids actually really nicely agree with each other. So, in this case, I think we can use these two records together. So to start with, when I was developing this, I looked at uh, three different areas of the Neoproterozoic stratigraphy. And so this is 500 million years. So this is the entire length of the Phanerozoic. And all these little symbols here you can see are the amount of data that, that I have, which I've combined with, of course, much more abundant literature data. But in these sections, I think you can nicely see from the early Neoproterozoic um, we have uh, carbonates that are dominated by dolomite in yellow. And then halfway through at about 650, we transition into a mixed limestone dolomite sequences. Our ooid symbols here, these little, um, these little targets, are our aragonite ooids. And you can see that every single symbol that's in the Neoproterozoic, this one's in the Cambrian, um, is actually made of aragonite. And our marine cements are a mix of aragonite, high magnesium calcite and dolomite in this yellow one here. And I think what this is suggesting at a very quick glance is that we're seeing instead of that secular variation in the Phanerozoic, we're seeing a stratigraphy that's dominated by aragonite and high magnesium conditions during this time. And um, which is a very different story, I think, than the, than the Phanerozoic. So, I've been working on extending this back through the Precambrian over the last little while, and this is probably something that I should have written up for publication way, way ago, um, but it's almost ready to be submitted. Uh, so here's an example from the late Paleoproterozoic. This is the MacArthur Basin in Australia. And on the left is a aragonite, uh, formerly aragonite marine cement, um, which has this relatively poor preservation. Um, and a lot of the precipitates we see during this time are aragonite. During this interval, we also see aragonite seafloor fans reappear for a little bit. Um, and then on the right here is an ooid that we interpreted as being made of calcite. Um, and this is only one of the very few ooids that we've seen in the entire record that um, we think precipitated as calcite. Um, when we go back further in time, we see that, that aragonite still dominates the sequence and other high magnesium precipitates. Um, so here again are our aragonite seafloor fans in the Archean. Um, and this unusual carbonate here in thin section, this is herringbone calcite, 
um, that appears in the Paleoproterozoic and the Archean is also thought to be a high magnesium precipitate. It has um, mycodolomite inclusions in it, for example. So we think that actually a lot of the Precambrian is dominated by um, aragonite and high magnesium um, carbonate precipitation. And so at the bottom here is um, my compilation as it stands um, so far. And you can see the numbers aren't especially high compared to the Phanerozoic, but they're the best that we can do. So in light blue here is um, times where we see aragonite and high magnesium calcite. These are often combined together in the literature. And you can see that this dominates most of the Precambrian. These little dark blue ones here are the only instances we see of low magnesium calcite or calcite ooids in the sequence. Um, and in fact, there should be another one in here. So there's about four occurrences of calcite ooids that I've been able to find. Um, and some of them are around the, the Shuram excursion and one in this, in this Archean. And then at the top here is the, um, the change in cements through time. So focusing on in dark blue herringbone calcite, which seems to dominate earlier on, and then a transition into dolomite, which seems to dominate more in the Neoproterozoic. And I think there's a lot to this story that, um, that I haven't figured out yet or, or that I'm still working on. Um, potentially there could be some um, instance of iron, dissolved iron in seawater being responsible for some of this change in carbonate precipitation. Um, but that's still very much a work in progress. But I think what this suggests, this data set together, is that the Precambrian is not, does not seem to be dominated by the type of secular variation we see in the Phanerozoic, and instead we see sustained high magnesium conditions. This um, got us to think about how would, we, how would we maintain high magnesium conditions? If this hypothesis is right, how could we do this using the Earth's system? And so one way, of course, is to just simply increase the amount of magnesium that's coming into seawater. Uh, and this is based on the fact that the Archean crust is thought to be much more magnesium rich than our modern crust. Um, and so potentially if we had a really high um, magnesium rich flux coming in during the Archean, could that magnesium hang over in the oceans all the way through until the Cambrian? Um, so that was one thing we wanted to test. And the second uh, thought we had about how we could sustain these really high magnesium conditions was more about buffering the magnesium concentration in seawater. And so one way we thought about this was via, um, via this redox history. So in the Precambrian, of course, we're looking at oceans that are anoxic. And in modern um, alteration of the oceanic crust, um, which is under oxic conditions, of course, we take up magnesium into clays in this low temperature alteration here. Um, but if we have really iron rich oceans, iron and, and magnesium really easily substitute in clays. And so perhaps this iron is swamping out our clay formation and we're, we're not removing magnesium anymore in our low temperature flux. Um, and we're only removing iron, in fact. So, in this case, we're decreasing the amount of magnesium that we've taken out of seawater and buffering its concentration. So essentially all that means is turning off the low temperature flux. And there's some evidence for this process actually in, in recent oceanic crusts. So this is a picture from um, Andrew's work in 1980, who showed that in oxic areas of, um, of basaltic alteration, you get clays that are magnesium rich and don't have much iron. But in anoxic areas, we actually see really iron rich clays without much magnesium in them. So we thought about coupling this to this redox history and seeing if this could potentially explain why we could maintain high magnesium. This is, um, this is a schematic of the model that we put together. And I say we, but this was very much the work of Shuang Zhang, who was at Yao with me, um, who is the real hero of this story. So this is a crustal recycling model and it focuses mainly on the magnesium cycle. Um, so we have the continental crust inputting magnesium into the oceans, which is removed by these three different processes. Some of this uh, crust and sediment is subducted and remelted into the continental crust. Um, this runs for up to three, three billion years of Earth's history, so it's a long process model. Um, and some of this sediment is, up, is exposed and uplifted and then re-weathered from the continental crust again. We start this model with a really uh, magnesium rich crust, so a basaltic composition, and at about 2.5 billion, we change it to an andesite composition. Calcium in the model, because we're interested in the magnesium calcium ratio, is set by much simpler parameters. So these are based on the carbonate system, essentially. 
And we think we've given fairly conservative estimates of, of these different parameters, and I've listed some of these here. When we have fluid inclusion data available, uh, we use that in the model as well. So first, this first hypothesis, can a higher magnesium um, input in the Archean from this mafic, more mafic crust um, actually sustain uh, magnesium through time? And so here's our transition from our basalt into andesite crust at about 2.5. And this is the relative amount of magnesium in seawater. And it turns out this starting point, whether it's modern or 1.5 times modern, has a really big impact on how the magnesium, of course, is sustained over time. This is a relatively simplistic model run that I've got up here. Um, and so yes, it seems like this having a higher initial magnesium in seawater does make a really big difference. But what about this low temperature flux? And this is slightly more complicated now. So on the left, I've got an example again of this model with magnesium calcium ratio now on this axis. Um, again, we're changing our crustal composition. In this left hand slide, I I make sure that the low temperature flux is operating like modern all the way through the model. So we're taking up magnesium into our clays. And on the right, I turn this flux on only in the Phanerozoic when um, we think the, the oceans started to become oxygenated. And so we're not removing magnesium in this part of the model now. But you can see the end point of both of these scenarios is around about the same. So magnesium calcium ratio around about the same. So it seems that this low temperature alteration really only has a minor effect on maintaining this magnesium through time. I should say as well that this blue envelope here um, represents um, the error on this model, which is Monte Carlo um, uncertainty on our calcium estimates, which, which we've just kind of put as a scatter plot of values in this case because of that uncertainty. So potentially if there are changes in calcium, we would see that kind of secular variation like you see in the um, modern model, but it would, it would center around this line. But it turns out there's a third aspect that we noticed when we were playing with the model that had a really big impact on sustaining magnesium through time. And that was actually the, um, the mineralogy of the carbonates that you precipitate from seawater. So on the left here is an example, again, with magnesium calcium ratio um, through time, where only 15% of the carbonate that we precipitate is dolomitized. Um, and this, is, this harks back to the idea of early dolomitization that occurs in the Cambrian. Um, but we know from a lot of records now, from that new one by Amantri Canteen, that a lot of the Precambrian is dominated by dolomite precipitation. Um, and, so, and so this is not direct precipitation from seawater, this is dolomitization of limestone. Um, and so when we have a higher amount of carbonate that's dolomitized, we actually buffer and maintain this magnesium in seawater through time. And this is kind of counterintuitive because dolomite should take out magnesium from seawater. But in fact, what we're doing is we're putting the magnesium into that much smaller subcycle of the model where we precipitate it in the seas, but then we uplift and re-weather it, um, which happens on a smaller time scale than the big crustal recycling. And so this, this has the effect of buffering that magnesium in the system for longer. And so putting all of that together, then this is our kind of best fit model for the carbonate record that, um, that I've looked through. And so at the top here, I've got the relative amount of dolomite precipitated or dolomitized limestone. So transitioning at around about 650, which is when we saw in that near protozoic transition. We start off with a magnesium calcium ratio about twice the modern, and this is based on that magnesium rich crust. Um, and we only have our low temperature flux operating in this orange area here when we think that the oceans became roughly oxidized. Um, so we see that we transition from uh, very high magnesium conditions all the way through the Precambrian, and we only get below this threshold um, for aragonite calcite seas for the first time in the Cambrian or towards the end of the Neoproterozoic. This part of the record, of course, is constrained by fluid inclusions. So we see um, our more modern like a more phanerozoic um, profile in here, and we end up at roughly the same concentration of magnesium in seawater today. Uh, and so I think this is a really nice um, attempt at, at thinking about magnesium cycling through time based on this very, very simple, um, simple carbonate mineralogy. And so just to put all that together then, um, this is uh, coming back to dolomite again, as I always do. Uh, it turns out it's the key to magnesium cycling in the Precambrian. 
Uh, so we start, of course, with a high magnesium concentration in seawater from this archaean rich crust, uh, magnesium rich crust. We maintain dolinization, and this is a process that's occurring from a, a seawater fluid. It's occurring during early diagenesis, um, most likely, and it's resulting in mimetic dolomitization. We then uplift and re-weather these, these dolomite lithologies and then repeat this. And this, I think, is really nicely shown in Madri Canteen's record where we have um, a high amount of dolomite in the Precambrian, and then this drops for the first time around about the Neoproterozoic um, Cambrian boundary. When we look more in more detail at the record, as I showed earlier, this change seems to occur at about 650. And this really nicely fits in with our 100 million year rock cycle because at 550 is when we first see our calcite seas. So I think this is um, potentially a really um, nice idea and something to follow up on um, with future work. But I'll just end now um, by end this kind of roller coaster ride through its history with the thousand things that I've thrown at you um, by saying that I think that we have had a really eventful chemical history of seawater, as Lawrence Hardy said. Um, seawater conditions have changed significantly through time. Um, and I think we need to use this as a starting point for looking at the record back, back in early Earth's history. Um, and I think now, I hope that I've shown you that the present oceans are not necessarily a direct um, way to understand Earth's past marine systems. And in particular, in terms of redox, it seems like the modern oceans may only extend back several hundred million years um, of a very, very long Earth's history. And so I hope that, um, I hope the geochemists and sedimentologists can kind of get together and really start to sort out um, a lot of these cycles in much more detail um, through the entirety of Earth's history. And I'll finish up with that and I'll just say thanks very much for listening in. Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed, Ash. That was a beautifully illustrated and fascinating um, story and it really showed the power of integrating petrography, geochemistry and modelling. So wonderful and inspirational to all of us. Many thanks indeed. Um, what I suggest is just uh, like uh, yesterday, um, please uh, pop your messages in the chat and I will read them out to Ash, um, your, your questions. Um, so I'm just, just waiting now for um, the questions to come in, Ash. Actually, maybe just as we're waiting, I could ask a quick question. Um, there's some experimental work that suggests that uh, the concentration of sulfate may also be important in this story and, and controlling the mineralogy of precipitates and that uh, the cutoff between aragonite and calcite seas may not be two, but maybe actually a lot lower, maybe even 1.2. Is that something that you've considered for the Precambrian story as well? Yeah, that's right. And there's a lot of different um, influences, in fact, on that magnesium calcium ratio that if you have different alkalinities and different um, situations, you're going to have a different value where you change calcite to aragonite. But I think overall, what I've found is that it is actually very difficult to precipitate calcite and you need to get things just right for it to form. So it turns out when you have, I think it's when you have higher sulfate, you're more likely to form aragonite. It sort of, it tends to stop calcite from forming. But this is counterintuitive to the Precambrian because there should be relatively low sulfate during these kind of anoxic times in general. So you would um, be favouring uh, calcite precipitation in that case, but that's not what we see in the record. So I think that um, sulfate is really important for looking at much more detailed changes than these kind of broad brush things that I was talking about. Um, but certainly um, there's, there's a huge amount of influences on it. Great, thank you. It sounds like your puppy is needing attention. <laughs> well, great. Um, so there's, a, there's a, a, a question come in here um, from Francesca. Great talk. How would you reconcile your model for Precambrian seawater chemistry with Archean ocean crust being hotter, e.g. Comatiites, and thus driving more high temperature alteration at mid-ocean ridges, which should therefore drive magnesium calcium ratios to be lower? Yeah, that's a really good point. And so there, there has been a lot of debate whether um, tectonics were super fast in the Archean based on really high heat loss. Um, and I'd say that we probably don't know enough about it to, um, to make any suggestion. If you were going to go the opposite way, you could say that 
um, the aragonide precipitation suggests, in fact, that you have slow C4 spreading rates um, if you're going to take the opposite approach. Um, but I think there's a lot of uncertainty here. There's uncertainty in things like the emergence of the continents, um, the, actually the origin of plate tectonics and how that would affect magnesium cycling. You know, if you had submerged land masses, would they um, exchange magnesium in the same way that our continental weathering does? Um, and so there's definitely a huge amount of questions in here. Um, and we've thought about using this record to, to push the idea of, of not potentially not a hot Archean, um, but I'm not comfortable enough to, to comment any further on that, really. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we've got a, another question from Matthew Walk. Brilliant talk. Thank you. Smiley face. Uh, how spatially variable do you think some of the shallow water Neo-Archean and Paleoproterozoic redox proxies are? And can we compare them? between basins or is it a basin by basin situation? I think with all, all this proxy work, there is, there's never really a global proxy. I think it's about compiling this, um, this information together to get a more, a more global picture. I think that's why it's been so confusing in, in parts of the Precambrian that there's been a paper come out saying it's oxidized, a paper saying it's eugenic, a paper saying it's frugonous, and all of these states could exist at once. Um, Hopefully we'll get to the point where we have enough data that we can say that statistically um, this percentage of the ocean seemed euxenic and this percentage seemed oxic. Um, but, you know, up until that point, I think it's very much um, a matter of just being careful with what we state about proxies. Thanks. Um, we have a question from Nick Tosca. Ash, love the talk. Thank you. The trend of decreasing magnesium calcium uh, ratios through time makes sense. But how might this be reconciled with your emerging records suggesting that sim sedimentary dolomite cements were apparently more common in the Tonian cryogenian compared to earlier intervals? <laughs> That's a very good question, and I was hoping that everyone would ask that because I really <laughs> know. <laughs> um, potentially, uh, there's some thought that um, it might be iron that is iron rich seawater that is related to dolomite precipitation. Um, it could be that I haven't really looked as far back into the Archean as, as I could, but uh, certainly the Neoproterozoic is thought to be relatively iron rich and that's when we see the Dolomite, um, whereas previous parts of the Proterozoic are more Euxenic and we see more of the herringbone calcite. But as to how that works in the Archean then, I don't really know. Um, it could be that other factors are involved in the Neoproterozoic, perhaps a higher supersaturation or um, some other processes um, that have to do with the evolution of life, perhaps more abundant microbial metabolisms during that time that precipitate dolomite. Um, but I will say that if anyone has an idea on that, I would be happy to hear it. <laughs> I've got a feeling that um, Nick's students may be presenting something on that general area in this next session anyway. Um, Thanks. Um, so just a, 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 a thank you from Jack Stacey. Um, thanks for a really interesting talk. And I just wanted to see if there are any other um, questions coming through. I, I was actually going to, to, to ask you a similar question to, to Matthew Walk. I mean, one thing we know about the, the EGHR in particular, since it's a lot of data, is just, as you say, just how heterogeneous the state is. There's no one linear narrative of oxygenation. And we have a very, very... Um, uh, locally heterogeneous states. Um, do you think we've got to a stage now with your, your wonderful new compilation of actually plotting that on a paleogeographic map and starting to say that do we have similar gradients that we do today with you know aragonite cal calcite gradients according to uh, uh, paleo latitudes? I mean, that would be great. I, I guess we can always try and do these things. Um, I think there's a, there'd be a huge amount of uncertainty, things like um, all the paleogeographic reconstructions for starters as we go back through time. Um, but yeah, as, as we get more and more data, that would be definitely something to look into, see if we can pinpoint where these, um, where these redox styles are, where these carbonates are precipitating. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got a few more questions coming through. Um, Fred Boyer, thanks very much, Ash. That was a great talk. Um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on dominant carbonate mineralogy and primary nutrient removal in orthogenic carbonate precipitates through time. I don't know if I have a very good answer on that. It's a very good question, Fred. Thank you. Um, I, 
I don't even know how I would answer that. I'm probably not a good nutrient person. I have to say phosphorus is, is not my favorite element. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think there's definitely changes in the style of orthogenic um, carbonate precipitation through time. And this is something that a lot of people are working on in the Precambrian as well. And I'm guessing Fred is one of them. Um, so I'm going to answer that by saying I have no idea. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so Fred, that's over to you to sort out. Um, Liam Alden, fantastic talk, Ash. And then um, Anthony Morgan um, asks, thank you for the talk. Um, are there any components of ocean chemistry that might not show up in the geological record because they aren't preserved? Yeah, I think that's that's a really good point. I think probably most of the of the record is not preserved, and many aspects of seawater are certainly not preserved. Um, whether, for example, um, people like Lizzie Trower have been working on um, unstable carbonate mineralogies, and so how you know how the carbonate forms, whether it's directly from seawater or via an amorphous phase, this is something I think that would be really great to know back in time. Um, but we just really don't have those records preserved that we can that we can test that. And that's one probably major aspect, at least of the carbonate record, um, that I would really like to know, but potentially we might not ever know. Yeah, yeah, we'd all, all like to go back in Alvid and go over these uh, Precambrian sea floors. Just seeing if there's any, any more questions coming through. Not, not yet at this point. Well, I think, Ash, um, it was a, a wonderful talk. It has generated a huge amount of interest and lots and lots of questions. And it, it gives us the perfect foundation for going into the next session here, which I think is good to, to develop some of the issues you've raised. But really terrific. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, now's the moment to uh, have that cold beer and... and <laughs> Let the puppy out if you need to. So thank you very much indeed for all of us. Really, really great. Thanks. Thanks very much for having me. Thank you. I'm going to